Hello, I'm Professor Von Schmohawk, and welcome to Why You. Polynomial functions are encountered in many different fields, such as science and engineering, medicine and social science, and economics and finance. When working with a polynomial function, it is often desirable to get a rough idea of its behavior by sketching an approximate graph of the function. In the previous lecture, we discussed some important characteristics to take into account when sketching the graph of a polynomial function. We saw that there are several characteristics that the graphs of all polynomial functions have in common. Since polynomial functions are continuous, their graphs have no breaks or jumps, so the line of the graph is uninterrupted. A simple way of thinking of a continuous graph is that it can be drawn in a single stroke without lifting the pen off the paper. In addition, polynomial functions are smooth. Graphs that are smooth have no sharp corners. Their slope is continuous at every point, never instantaneously changing to a new value. Another important characteristic of polynomial functions is that their domain includes the set of all real numbers extending infinitely in both the negative and positive directions. So while keeping these features in mind, a good place to start when graphing a polynomial function is to find the function's x-intercepts. A function's x-intercepts graphically show the values of x that cause the function's value to be zero. For this reason, these x-values are called the zeros of the function. In the previous lecture, we saw that although one can always find the zeros of first or second degree polynomial functions, there are no methods as straightforward as the quadratic formula to find the zeros of higher degree polynomial functions that will work in every case. However, as we have seen, the zeros of any polynomial function can be determined if we can factor that polynomial into a product of linear terms. For example, this function is the product of three linear factors x times x minus 1 times x plus 2. The zero product property tells us that the values of x that cause any of these factors to have a value of zero will also cause the polynomial to have a value of zero. The zeros of the polynomial can therefore be found by setting each linear factor equal to zero and solving for x. So the zeros of this function occur when x is 0, 1, and negative 2. These zeros correspond to x-intercepts at the origin at coordinates 1, 0, and at coordinates negative 2, 0. Once we have determined the graph's x-intercepts, we must then determine the shape of the graph that passes through those points. As we saw in the previous lecture, there are many shapes that the graph of a polynomial function can have while intersecting the x-axis at only these points. So once we have found a function's x-intercepts, how do we determine the shape of the graph that passes through these points? In some cases, a graph may cross the x-axis at each x-intercept, while in other cases, a graph may only touch the x-axis at its intercepts, reflecting back without crossing the axis. A graph may also touch the x-axis at some intercepts and cross the x-axis at others. 
Therefore, it would be helpful if at each intercept, we could determine if the graph crosses the x-axis or only touches the x-axis without crossing it. Fortunately, this can be determined from the polynomial's factors. We can gain insight into what a polynomial's factors tell us about how its graph passes through its x-intercepts by looking at the graphs of some simple polynomial functions. For example, consider the simple polynomial function f of x equals x. This polynomial has only a single linear factor, x. The graph of this function has a single x-intercept, and at that intercept, the graph crosses the x-axis. Now let's look at the polynomial function f of x equals x squared. This polynomial has a repeated linear factor x. The graph of this function also has an x-intercept at the origin. And at that intercept, the graph touches the x-axis without crossing it. Likewise, the function x cubed also has a repeated factor x, and like the first function, it crosses the x-axis at its intercept. These functions all contain the linear factor x. However, that factor appears a different number of times in each function. The number of times that a factor appears is called the factor's multiplicity. Therefore, we say that in these polynomials, the factor x has a multiplicity of 1, 2, and 3, respectively. As we continue to examine polynomial functions with factors of higher multiplicities, we can see a relationship between a graph's behavior and its x-intercepts and the corresponding factor's multiplicity. At intercepts that correspond to linear factors with odd multiplicities, the function's graph crosses the x-axis and therefore has opposite signs on either side of the intercept. And at intercepts that correspond to factors with even multiplicities, the graph only touches the x-axis without crossing it and therefore has the same sign on either side of the intercept. Also notice that at intercepts corresponding to factors with multiplicities greater than 1, at the intercept, the graph's slope becomes horizontal. Only intercepts that correspond to a factor with a multiplicity of 1 have a non-zero slope at the intercept, crossing the x-axis at an angle. So let's see how these relationships between a factor's multiplicity and the corresponding x-intercept would apply to a polynomial function with more than one x-intercept. This is the graph of the function x cubed minus 3x minus 2. This function is the product of the linear factors x minus 2 and the repeated factor x plus 1. The factor x minus 2 occurs only once, and therefore has an odd multiplicity of 1. To determine the x-intercept that corresponds to that factor, we set the factor equal to 0, and solve for x. The 0 when x equals 2 tells us that there is an x-intercept located at coordinates 2, 0. And since the factor associated with that intercept has an odd multiplicity, it crosses the x-axis with opposite signs on either side of the intercept. Also, since the multiplicity is not greater than 1, at that intercept the graph crosses the x-axis at an angle with a non-zero slope. On the other hand, the factor x plus 1 occurs twice, so it has an even multiplicity of 2. Setting that factor equal to 0 and solving for x,
We see that there is another zero when x equals negative 1 with a corresponding x-intercept at coordinates negative 1, 0. Since the factor associated with that intercept has an even multiplicity, the graph touches the x-axis without crossing the axis. So once we have factored the polynomial function x cubed minus 3x minus 2 into a product of linear terms and use those terms to determine the graph's x-intercepts, we almost have enough information to sketch a graph of the function. From the factor's multiplicities, we know that the graph crosses the x-axis at coordinates 2, 0 and touches the x-axis at coordinates negative 1, 0 without crossing the axis. So the graph may look something like this. But since we don't know which direction it crosses the x-axis, it could also look like this. However, an easy way to resolve this is to look at the polynomials in behavior. In the lecture, Building Polynomial Functions, we saw that in a polynomial function, the term with the largest exponent, called the leading term, determines the functions in behavior. As x takes on very large positive or negative values, the leading term's exponent, along with the sign of the term's coefficient, determines whether the function's graph will grow infinitely positive or negative. This makes sense because when the value of x becomes large, the term with the largest exponent ultimately overpowers the other terms in the polynomial. There are four possible in behaviors for a polynomial function depending on whether the leading term's exponent is odd or even and whether its coefficient is positive or negative. If the leading term has an even exponent, the function's in behavior will be similar to the in behavior of even powers of x. And as with even powers of x, when the leading term's coefficient is positive, the graph will grow infinitely positive for large positive and negative x values. Likewise, when the coefficient is negative, that in behavior is reversed. On the other hand, when the leading term has an odd exponent, the function's in behavior will be similar to odd powers of x. In that case, when the leading term's coefficient is positive, the graph will grow infinitely positive for large positive x values and infinitely negative for large negative x values. And when the coefficient is negative, that in behavior is reversed. So with this additional information, we can now determine how this function's graph passes through each x-intercept. The function's leading term, x cubed, has an odd exponent and a positive implied coefficient of 1. Therefore, its end behavior will be positive for large positive x values and negative for large negative x values. Since the graph crosses the x-axis at intercept 2, 0, to the right of that intercept, the graph will continue to grow without bounds in the positive direction. Likewise, at intercept negative 1, 0, to the left of that intercept, the graph will continue to grow without bounds in the negative direction. Since the graph does not cross the x-axis anywhere but these two points, we know the graph must be negative everywhere between the two x-intercepts. Therefore, the graph might look something like this. Or perhaps like this. Although we know how this function's graph intersects the x-axis, we don't know much about the shape of the graph further away from those intercepts. 
However, we can clear up some of these ambiguities by calculating a few well-chosen points. One easy point to calculate for any polynomial function is the point where the graph intersects the vertical axis. At that point, the value of x is zero. So the value of every term in the polynomial except the constant term becomes zero. This tells us that the graph intersects the vertical axis at coordinates zero, negative two. Another easy point to calculate is for an x value of one. In this example, when x is one, the first term becomes one cubed or one, and the second term becomes negative three times one or negative three. So the function's value when x is one is one minus three minus two or negative four. Therefore, the graph also passes through the point one, negative four. Knowing the location of these two points, we can now make a better sketch of the graph's shape between its two x-intercepts. Now it would be helpful to get a better idea of the graph's path when x is less than negative one. So let's calculate the graph's value when x is negative two. When x is negative two, the first term becomes negative two cubed or negative eight, and the second term becomes negative three times negative two or positive six. So the function's value when x is negative two is negative eight plus six minus two or negative four. The graph therefore passes through the point negative two, negative four. Notice that there is one point where the graph changes direction from increasing to decreasing, and a second point where the graph changes direction from decreasing to increasing. Points where a graph changes direction like this are called turning points. So we say that this graph has two turning points. But how do we know that this function's graph doesn't have more turning points? Fortunately, there is a mathematical relationship involving turning points that can help us answer this question. This relationship states that the maximum number of turning points in the graph of a polynomial function is one less than the degree of the polynomial. Since this is a third degree polynomial, this function's graph can have no more than two turning points. In all the polynomial functions we have graphed so far, each factor corresponded to an x-intercept. However, you may sometimes encounter polynomial functions where some factors don't correspond to x-intercepts. Take, for example, the polynomial function x to the fourth power plus 4x squared. Since both terms in this polynomial have a common factor x squared, this polynomial can be written as x squared times x squared plus 4. As we have seen, x squared can be written as the linear factor x with a multiplicity of two. Setting the factor x equal to zero, we see that this function has a zero when the value of x is zero. This zero corresponds to an x-intercept at the origin. Since the factor associated with that intercept has an even multiplicity, at the origin, the graph touches the x-axis without crossing it. However, the remaining factor, x squared plus four, cannot be factored any further. If we set this quadratic factor equal to zero, 
and solve for x. We get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 4. Since there are no real square roots of negative numbers, there are no real zeros or x-intercepts associated with this factor. Therefore, the only x-intercept for this function's graph is at the origin. Since the polynomial's leading term, x to the fourth power, has an even exponent and a positive implied coefficient, we know that the end behavior for this function is positive for large positive and negative values of x. So the graph of this function looks like this. So far, we have learned a number of techniques that can help us sketch approximate graphs of polynomial functions. However, it is important to be aware that there are polynomial functions where these techniques will not give us all the information needed to sketch a complete graph. For example, the function x cubed minus 3x plus 3 has a turning point that is not an x-intercept. Therefore, there is no factor that corresponds to that turning point. Additionally, some polynomial functions have no x-intercepts. In these cases, if a graphing utility is not available, the function's value can be calculated at various points to get a general idea of the graph's shape. But fortunately, there are many common polynomial functions that can be sketched using the techniques in this lecture. In the next several lectures, we will see how polynomials can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided to create new types of functions.